Welcome to Brandon Events. We are delighted to be joined by Michael Cholby, and we're going to be talking about grief. Michael, would you like to start with a thought experiment? I would be happy to. So let's suppose that you have a close friend who is in the midst, perhaps even in the throes of grief. They've suffered the death of someone very important to them, perhaps a parent to whom they were close or a sibling, perhaps even more upsettingly, a child perhaps. You're concerned about their well-being. You're worried that they are perhaps losing their ability to thrive. There are, of course, a number of things that occur to you that you might do. You might put them in touch with a counselor or a priest, or you might just be supportive, be available to converse with them. But as a coincidence has it, you are also a neurochemist, a biochemist, and you happen to have developed a drug that can eliminate all of the emotional manifestations of grief and eliminate the sensation or sense of loss that seems to be incorporated into grief. So the question at hand is, should you even consider administering this drug? Would this be a favor that you'd be doing to the friend? Or would it be something that you should be deeply hesitant about on the grounds that perhaps you're depriving them of something very valuable or worthwhile to them? Great. My question to you then is, why think that it is in your book, you say that, look, look what's valuable here, that you the grieving process is valuable. It's a contributory good in terms of self-knowledge, that is in discovering a feature of your practical psychological identity, in particular, your relationship to the decedent in the past and your, re your relationship to her going forward. But as your example seems to argue against your position, because you can imagine a case where you can gain the same self-knowledge through the pill, a variant in your case, in which case the suffering adds nothing to the self-knowledge. Or you can imagine a case where you have someone like Spock, who is not going to get anything in self-knowledge because he just instantaneously calculates it upon death. Or you can imagine a case where someone who's psychologically weak, like myself, has less self-understanding after going through the grieving process. It, it disrupts my ability to consider evidence. And so all three cases seem to suggest that I either gain nothing in self-knowledge through suffering or lose self-knowledge. I'm assuming here that an opportunity for self-knowledge, opportunities themselves are not intrinsically good. So my question to you is, in these cases, do you still think that it's good for someone good simplicator or rational to go through the grieving process. Let's see if I can dissect a few of the issues that your comments raise. So I think the first thing to emphasize is that if we did in fact have a pill that enabled us to acquire the kind of self-understanding or self-knowledge that I've said is distinctive to grief, then of course there might be a good case, right? For administering the pill, right, rather than undergoing the various emotional toils, right, associated with grief. But of course, we don't have such a pill. And it seems to me that what, given that we don't have such a pill, and it'd be difficult to imagine that we could develop one, that what we should think of grief then is that it provides us something that is emotionally indispensable, right? That it's the best tool that we have for the acquisition of the kind of self-knowledge that I think that grief can afford us. Now, of course, if we, I did in fact know of my close friend that no self-knowledge could come from his grief, then perhaps I might be doing him a favor, right, by administering this drug to him. But I think that requires a degree of omniscience that probably none of us are actually in a position to have. I don't think any of us are in a position to know whether or not someone, someone else's grief is likely to be beneficial in this particular sort of way. So I would think that at the very least, if you were to be administering the drug, you'd be taking a very big risk, right? You'd be depriving, right, a person of an opportunity for I think something that is a crucial kind of value in human life, right? Our ability to form, right? A kind of self-conception, or as I tend to use the term practical identity, that incorporates other people. And when other people leave us due to death, it enables us, grief enables us to reconstruct that practical identity, to put our self-understanding on a new and different footing. So I do think there would be a lot of risk involved at the very least in, in thinking that you would be doing something benevolent toward your friend. But the thought experiment is in some sense meant to highlight what I think of as, in some sense, the core question, at least that's addressed in my book, which is what I call the paradox of grief, right? Grief seems to involve a whole bunch of emotions that we would typically not want to have. Sadness, sometimes guilt, worry, anxiety. And yet the thought that we should want to be rid of it 
I think strikes a lot of us as counterintuitive. So the challenge I think for philosophers or among the challenges for philosophers that grief presents is that how do we make sense of those two thoughts? Can we reconcile those two thoughts? So if I could just follow up on this. So I hear what you're saying about this being unrealistic, number one, and requiring omniscience, but still imagine cases like trolley cases and things like that, that are fairly unrealistic. And you can easily imagine emotionally weak individuals who in fact end up with less, less self-understanding going through the grieving process. My claim is just in that as a matter of our intuitions, you should suffer even if there is no gain in self-knowledge. And the idea here is an organic unity effect, the organic unity effect, so much to desert a virtue. It's just fitting or appropriate that when your beloved spouse of 30 years dies, that you be torn apart regardless of the gains to yourself. And I take it that this is an isolation case designed to show that it's fittingness and not self-knowledge that makes grieving prudentially good or rational or so on. That's a very good question. I don't see myself any deep connection between a state like grief being fitting or appropriate and it's being a benefit to you or it's being prudentially good for you. I think that the we have to defend, right, as I've tried to defend, there being some good that is a consequence of grieving in order to make sense of the idea that there's something prudentially value about, valuable about it. Now, that said, I think a lot of people have the intuition that seems to be driving the comments you just made that there would be something suitable, righteous, I suppose, right, about grieving the death of someone who was very important to you. And I think there we're in a different sort of realm, right? We're in the realm perhaps less of the self-regarding and more in the realm of the other regarding, the thought that um, it's important that a person's loss not go unnoticed in the world. Perhaps it's important insofar as you think we can owe things to the dead, that we relate to the dead as dead, right? That we recognize that they are no longer with us. I think there are ways of explaining the intuition that I think was driving your remarks that don't speak against the self-knowledge account of the way in which grief is valuable, prudentially valuable to us. But that would take us in a somewhat different direction. In fact, in future work, it's a direction that I'm trying to explore a little bit. In my book, I think the one area I would probably want to revisit or maybe correct myself is I actually think that there is a case to be made that in some kinds of relationships, we do have a duty to the deceased to grieve them. And I think that I was perhaps a bit too hasty in my book in, in rejecting that claim. So I wonder about who the appropriate objects of grief should be. We will often think about loved ones. Steve gives the example of someone you've been married to for 30 years. But there's also a sense in which people grieve for public figures. So when David Bowie died, people felt a lot of grief for when Princess Diana died. And I wonder if it would be a good thing to practice grieving on a regular basis, that it's <laughs> going to be quite a common thing for someone that you're aware of to die, and whether that would be a virtuous thing to then grieve for them. And I also wonder if we should grieve not just for people, but for other things. Should we grieve for the loss of animals that are killed in slaughterhouses? Should we grieve for, let's say, a nation that changes its character? Is there some kind of different thing about grieving for a human being or grieving for other kinds of losses? Yeah, so I'm hearing, I think, maybe three things in there. So let me see if I can address, address them. One of the advantages of the account of the nature of grief that I defend, as I see it, is that it allows us to explain both of what I would think of as paradigmatic cases of grief, grieving spouses, parents, that sort of thing, but also grieving David Bowie or grieving a political leader that you admire. Because on my view, we grieve because the individual who has died was part of our practical identity, and people can play different roles in our practical identities, right? Some of the people who are central to our practical identity are people that we love. Others of them are people that we emulate. Others of them are people that we view as perhaps moral role models. And I think that this is important in terms of explaining the variety of different kinds of grief experiences that other people's deaths can give rise to. I'm slightly taken aback, maybe even a little bit offended sometimes when a lot of the academic literature on grief talks about grieving David Bowie or something like that. And they talk about it as grieving a parasocial relationship, right? Which I think has a sort of subtle way of saying it ain't real. <laughs> and I guess my own sense is, yeah, I think it's pretty real. It doesn't have the same dynamics. The relationship doesn't have the same dynamics, obviously, as your relationship to your mother or my relationship to my spouse. That doesn't mean you can't grieve 
or we don't grieve when those relationships or when the people in those relationships die. As far as what sorts of things can be grieved, my own sense is that we've got a very, or people very often have a very kind of loose notion of grief where it amounts to feeling bad about the loss of something. <laughs> people have been talking in recent years about ecological grief and grieving an ecosystem, grieving a glacier, grieving an extinction and so forth. And I think part of what's going on there is that grief has this very kind of hallowed aura to it. I think we can invoke it when we're trying to up the emotional ante and explain that something is deeply felt to us. But I think in most cases, I don't view those, or I don't think we should view those as instances of grief. And the reason for that is that I think that there is something about grief that is that links it very closely to relationships. Okay? And I think that you can have a relationship with an ecosystem. So I think a farmer can clearly have a relationship with a field. I think a, a, a person can have a relationship to a, an ecosystem, say, that they enjoyed recreation in, a place where you've gone fishing or boating or something like that. But I think upon hearing a glacier in some part of the world is melting and I don't have any sort of prior engagement with it, I don't understand this place, I don't understand this thing, I don't have any kind of a deep history with this thing, I would just say you lament it. But I don't really think you grieve it in some interesting sense. That said, I think that it's, again, it's very possible to grieve ecosystems, places, homes, dwellings, communities, institutions. But I think that in order to do that, those things have to be identity constituting for us. Right? They have to be central to us in the way that people can be central to us. And the idea that we should seek out grief? Ah, I think we should seek it out, though this is something that I'm trying to figure out exactly why. It does seem to me that grieving is probably something that we can learn how to do. My own research has not uncovered any sort of psychological work on this question. There's very little work, as far as I can tell, on grief and moral development or grief's relationship to personality or to character. In a paper published, I think it was in 2004, Robert Solomon said that you know, grief is related to a, a virtue like gratitude, right? that it's somehow bound up with our ability to recognize how dependent we are on other people. And I think that one of the things I'd like to do in subsequent philosophical research brief is to be able to maybe give some names to the, the character traits that I think grieving exhibits. I think a lot of the things that we think of as virtues have a lot to do with changing the world or reacting to the world. And I think there is some virtue involved in the person who can be susceptible to grief, right? Who is able to form the kinds of relationships that for which grief is sensible and but I don't know that we exactly have a word for this. It's like vulnerability, something like that. But I'm not quite sure if that exactly hits the nail on the head. But one way I think to appreciate the, the notion that there is some connection, I think, between grief and moral virtue is that psychopaths, right, notoriously don't seem to grieve or grieve very little. And psychopaths seem to have a good many traits that we would think of as vices. So I think there is some connection between learning to grieve and having good moral character over one's lifetime but I think that this is still very much underexplored territory, not only by, by philosophers by, by my, like myself, but also scholars in other fields. So as I mentioned, Michael, I think the theory is a brilliant one, and I really enjoyed um, reading your book. So I'm wondering if there's a correct amount of grief, and by amount, intensity times duration, perhaps also by a, a quality multiplier. If you think like certain emotions, sadness are more important than others, like anxiety or resentment. Then, okay. But, anyways, that's the rough equation. And my idea is that think about a teenager who loses her mother, with whom she has a very loving and close relation, and also, but doesn't mourn, it doesn't grieve very much at her mother's death, right? Surprisingly little. And then Taylor Swift dies. Taylor Swift doesn't die, but didn't die. But imagine Taylor Swift did die, and the teenager is completely broken up. What we would tell her is you're grieving incorrectly, that you're doing it wrong. And doesn't that show that there is a correct amount of grief and that we can discover through equation, particularly the equation would be something like your loss times the decedent's loss or your loss plus the decedent's loss? That rough equation sounds correct to me. It seems to me that when we think about how people should grieve, we're asking both about the kinds of emotions and so forth they should undergo, whether they should feel sadness, anxiety, resentment, guilt, what have you, 
and also how much of those different emotional ingredients they should feel. So I think that sounds more or less on target. I think there is an important question whether telling the girl in the example you just gave that she's grieving incorrectly is likely to lead her to grieve better. <laughs> Sometimes it's not so much that the truth hurts, but maybe there are other ways to encourage the behavior rather than pointing out that she's doing it badly. But the other thing I would say is that I very much emphasize in my work the idea that grief is, psychologically speaking, a example of attention, right? That we're attending to a phenomenon, right? We're attending to a relationship that has been transformed by the other person's death. And so the only sort of hesitation I would have about the kind of formula that you laid out is that I think we don't necessarily know beforehand, you know, exactly what the right values are within that formula. I think in some sense, grief is our way of discovering, right? So what some of the right values are in that formula. Grief can surprise us, right? We can find out in the course of grieving that maybe somebody mattered more to us than we thought, or maybe less than we thought, or mattered to us in a way that we hadn't realized. So I think that the paint is right. We want to emphasize that in some sense, I think grief is the process by which we figure all of that out rather than thinking that we could know antecedently sort of exactly what the values are for all of those different variables that you were referring to. So the discovery process and the way in which you're suggesting, could it be that we we do the opposite of discovery. We arrive at the wrong fact. Imagine that you have an individual. So if I remember correctly, and I might be misremembering, but Aaron Smut says that a lot of people seem to go back to normal psychologically after the death of a long-term spouse after three months. Imagine after three months, you're going to the Caribbean and you're dating and you're drinking lots of drinks with umbrellas in them. And you conclude from that, I guess that my 30-year spouse, I just didn't love her that much. I, I, in fact, I was mistaken. Could it be that you're just incorrect? You did love her a lot. She was extraordinarily significant to her, to you. And what the, whatever the opposite of discovery is, that you misunderstand your past relationship with her, and this leads you to also misunderstand your future relationship with her, assuming you can have a relationship with, with someone who no longer exists. That sounds correct. There is a dimension of grieving, on my view, that is, you just call it a discovery process, that is epistemic, right? I think we're in some sense trying to figure out what matters to us or what mattered to us about some relationship that has been disrupted by the other person's death. And as with any other epistemic process, any other inquiry, we can do it well or badly. Right? We, can, we can be careful and thoughtful. We can attend to the wide array of emotions that we're feeling, or we can perhaps out of fear of you know, feeling too strongly or being embarrassed. We can try to quash certain emotions and thereby maybe put good grieving out of reach, derail this inquiry. So like any other process of inquiry, it can be done well or badly. And certainly at the end of it, it may be the case that we haven't discovered really why the relationship was important to us. Maybe we've been engaged in a sustained process of self-deception in a way, right? Or delusion or something like that. That six-month bit, right, which, of course, Smut cites, but was also made well-known in philosophy by, by Dan Moeller, it's important to keep in mind exactly what that really says, right? It says that people's reported sense of day-to-day -day happiness, right, tends to bounce back in about six months, which is not the same, right, I think, as their grieving ending in six months. Because, of course, there can be a good many other things going on in grief other than things that sort of diminish day-to-day -day functioning. So I always want to suggest that people should take that, those findings with something of a grain of salt and not to infer too much from them. So there's a not an nine o'clock news sketch where two politicians are on a TV show and they're at each other's throats. They're just filled with vitriol and accusing each other of the most despicable things. And the one gets so angry that he has a heart attack and he dies on the stage. And Rowan Atkinson plays the surviving politician and he immediately moves into a tribute a mid-argument for his dead opponent. And so I wonder about whether we should grieve those that are our enemies, and maybe they're enemy colleagues. So they could be that you're at each other's throats in the political arena, or that they are generally bad people. And I wonder if that's different to mourning them. Often it's the case that people that die and who've done terrible things, there feels like there's this obligation to speak about them in good terms, that it's wrong to speak ill of the dead and that our mourning should generally speak about them glowingly and it's quite rare for people to bring up the bad things when the person dies but that seems like a strange view to my mind because the person is no longer there so you can't hurt their feelings it seems like there's a platform about the 
at the time of their death, if they did despicable things, now seems like the time to talk about the things that they did. So when Robert Mugabe died, I found it very disheartening that the BBC would write about him in glowing terms as a, a, a new leader in the African liberation movement. This is someone who killed 20,000 people and caused immense amounts of suffering in his country. Now seems like the time to dance in his grave. And I wonder if you think that how grieving and mourning should tie up with how we treat the dead. Those are some big questions. So let me see if I can address a few threads within it. So I certainly think people do and can grieve their enemies and rivals. It seems to me that it's understandable that they would if, as seems to be the case, your rivals or enemies are part of your practical identity, right? If you've spent a lot of your life trying to, I think the example that comes to mind is like John McEnroe and Bjorn Borg, right? Two athletes, right? I don't think they're on bad terms, but even supposing that they were, you know, it would make sense, I think, for either of them to grieve the death of the other, right? Their identities have in some sense been served to shape one another, right, over time. I think that makes complete sense. I think in terms of grieving and mourning, I tend to think that it's important here to honor something of a distinct between grieving on the one hand being primarily a private endeavor and mourning being primarily a public endeavor. It seems to me that there's nothing per se wrong about Robert Mugabe's family grieving his death, his friends grieving his death. And that's because, of course, he was a person and his identity was, in, was entangled in theirs and theirs in his. I think mourning, of course, is a different business because mourning is our effort to inscribe in the public sphere, right, this person's life and death. I think there we're in a fairly complicated realm in terms of asking ourselves who it is that we want to represent fondly through mourning, who it is that we think should not be represented positively through mourning. I think I share some of your sentiment, Mark, insofar as whenever I hear someone say, we shouldn't speak ill of the dead, my reaction is, when, when should we? Right? <laughs> is there a better touch of you? Know? When they're living, well, they're, that's dice here. So that, I think I agree with some of the sentiments here. Just to give a very concrete example of that, I think underscores the problem. I spoke to a number of media outlets in the week after the death of Queen Elizabeth II. And, you know, of course, many of the representatives of the media asked me things like, is the UK a nation in mourning and so forth? And I had to say, it's complicated here. There are some people who are grieving the Queen, some people who are not. In many cases, they're, not, they're grieving because they simply, she wasn't a sort of significant part of their lives, but others for whom she was this kind of decade-long maternal national symbol. But then, of course, there's the mourning question. She is a representative of an institution that many people think shouldn't exist. On the other hand, she sometimes seemed to have done some positive things with the power or authority that was given her. I think we're always hashing these things out with respect to public figures whose legacies are ambiguous or complicated. I think that there's no, we should not be hesitant to say that maybe everyone's death should be grieved, but maybe not everyone's death should be mourned or mourned so emphatically, so visibly. So you alluded earlier to the idea that you could have an obligation to the deceased to grieve them. And I wonder how that plays out. Do they have a survivable interest? Or should we only cash out grief in terms of a duty to yourself? As you say, it puts you on this journey of self-discovery. If you denied yourself the grief, you'd be shortchanging yourself. And that kind of duty, of course, you might think it would be good if you grieved in a set of circumstances. But to say that it's a full obligation seems strong as well. To deny mm -hmm. yourself every benefit. There's many benefits that we deny ourselves. We don't have to yeah. seize every opportunity. Yeah. A couple of points to pick up there. One of the things I think is difficult to know is how we as moral philosophers like me are going to draw the boundary between what we have very good moral reason to do and what we have a moral duty to do. I'm not sure what kinds of arguments you can muster in favor of saying that something that we have a very strong moral reason to do is also a moral duty. What I've argued in the past is that I think we do have strong reasons of a kind of moral kind that we in, in certain ways owe it to ourselves if we care about the people that we are and, our, and care about our, ourselves as agents and choosers and valuers to pursue the kind of self-knowledge I think grief can afford us. I'm less confident that I know how to turn that into a duty exactly, but I think having a really strong moral reason might just be a duty. Right? Now, in terms of the duty owed to the deceased, there's, of course, one huge, or well, more than one, several huge questions there in the philosophy of death and dying to think about whether the dead can be wronged, and if so, when the wronging occurs, and so forth. But let me sketch just a sort of picture that I've been working on 
about how there could be a duty to grieve, at least in the context of mutually loving relationships. I'm not sure I think there's a duty to grieve outside of that context, even if we're grieving someone with whom we don't stand in a mutually loving relationship. But when you think about a mutually loving relationship, I think we have all sorts of duties related to what I call practical fidelity. The idea being that a relationship that is a mutually loving one is one where the parties recognize one another's deepest interests and concerns and values. Their concerns are shaped by the values and concerns of the other. And there's a process by, over time by which they adapt their practical identities to the emerging facts about the other person. So to give you a simple sort of example, I think that parents for, can fail their adult children when they continue to treat the adult children like their adolescents. It's as if the parent's practical identity hasn't kept pace with the child's practical identity. The parent's practical identity is lagging behind it. That's a sort of example where it seems to me that the parent has failed in this, in this duty that I call the duty of practical fidelity. And how does that bear on grief? I think that in the end, we have a kind of duty relating to the deceased, even say, owe to the deceased, to make it the case that our practical identities reflect the fact of their deaths, right? That we're not continuing to relate to them as if they were alive or continuing to relate to them as if their interests and concerns and so forth haven't changed due to death. So there's a way in which I think that we owe the deceased a duty to grieve insofar as by grieving, we are put in a position where we are adapting, right, our own practical identities to facts about their practical identities. And what, what more significant transformation in your practical identity could there be than to die? Right. It's a bit as, as wide ranging a change in your practical identity as I think you can imagine. So that's the sort of picture that I am edging toward in some, in some work I've been doing recently. And I should add that this is work where I'm partnering with Jordan McKenzie at Virginia Tech, who has some similar ideas about the role of curiosity, right? And knowing another person and adapting your, your sense of self to their sense of self, right? And that this is central to, to loving relationships in particular. So I, I want to follow up on, on Mark's concern about a moral reason to grieve. Imagine that one thought, and your work seems to be open to this, that when you grieve, you don't discover your values or your beliefs or your desires. You create them in some sense. You shape them so that grief involves creation much more so than involves discovery. Now, if that is correct, it's a little hard to see why you have a reason to create or recreate your values or your desires or your beliefs, as opposed to just leaving them where they stand. And it's even more mysterious as to why you would have a reason to create them when the reason is other regarding. That is, assuming that you think the decedent is gone, it seems that you can't have a reason owed to another at a time in which the other isn't there. Two questions. One, is it the case that there's a problem in explaining why there's a moral reason, let alone a duty to grieve, if what you're doing is you're creating your psychology rather than discovering it? And two, even if there were a moral reason, and again, I doubt it because of the creation issue, isn't it really mysterious how it could be other regarding when the other is no longer there? Second one first. So I'm of the opinion that I think we can behave in behaviors, sorry, engage in behaviors when another person is dead that wrong the living person, that is to say wrong retrospectively, right? The person that was once alive, okay? That of course involves a whole bunch of complicated questions about how to understand who the subject of a posthumous harm is. My view is that the subject of a posthumous harm is not the posthumous person, it's the person that was once alive. So in this sense, I'm what I suppose in the literature is called a kind of priorist about when posthumous events can benefit or harm a person. And so the first point, I'm actually quite sympathetic to the thought that much of what's going on in grieving is somewhat more akin to creation rather than discovery. And part of, I think, what's going on here is that when we are engaged in grieving, we are, as I try to argue, in something of a kind of identity crisis. We're trying to figure out what we can about trying to figure out what we value. We've come to recognize that we can't quite proceed in the world as we did before, right? A person who is in some way um, central to some set of values or commitments that we have can't play that same role anymore. And we are tossed, right, into a kind of a crisis of our own identity. 
But I think in trying to reorient ourselves in the world, finding our way in the world again, I think we are discovering in some cases what we care about or value. But I think at the same time, we're probably asking ourselves questions right, about what we want to care about and value. Right? There's a perspective dimension to grieving too. We're not just trying to measure the loss. We're also trying to figure out what we're going to, what's going to matter to us in the future, right? Our practical identities are formed with reference to the past, but they project us into the future. And there's a dimension of this that I think is, you put in terms of creation, I think that there's a way in which what we're doing in grieving is we're engaged in a kind of normative interpretation of ourselves. We're looking at how, what we're feeling and doing. We're trying to make sense of our reactions. Why is it that I feel this way? And we're doing so in part to understand the nature of the loss, but also to figure out what we're going to be like going forward, right? What is our practical identity going, going to look like going forward? So we're asking in the spirit of a philosopher like Richard Moran, questions about ourselves that are also, if you will, normative questions, right? I think the question, who am I, is always suffused not merely with descriptive content, right? It's not just a psychological question. I think it's also a normative question, right? When we pose these questions about what our identities are, we're not posing a question that is a purely descriptive or abstract matter. We're also asking what matters to us. So I think that there's space to incorporate what you're calling sort of creation. I think in the end, the good that we can get out of grief, I call it in some of my work, self-knowledge, is a kind of self-understanding, right? Or a kind of normative self-insight. So I want to return to the earlier case that you gave where the parents wrong the child because they fail to recognize the change in the identity of the child. The child is now a grown up and they still treat them like an infant, an infant, and that seems improper. Now, it seems like you owe them that obligation because they're still around and they have an ongoing interest in being treated as the person that they have become. Now, in the case where someone is deceased, it seems that what you're doing is really treating them as if they were still there, that you're using a prior version of them. So in other words, you're treating them analogously as if they were a child when in fact they are deceased. And so it might be that it's hard to carry over the analogous case because the being that you're mourning for or have a duty to mourn for no longer exists, could have no ongoing interest in your behavior because they don't exist. And so the question is, if they had an interest at the time, which is, let's say, I, I want you to mourn for me upon my death, how do you respect that interest given that they're no longer there to experience the interest being met? One of the desires that I think we form vis-a-vis -vis loving relationships is that the other relate to us as we are, not as they would like us to be or as we once were and so forth. And when we die, then that desire is extinguished in the psychological sense, but it's not extinguished in the sense that we wanted to be satisfied, right? At various points after our death, I can have various sorts of things that I want to be true, right? And that maybe can only be true, right? Once I'm dead. Right. To give the obvious sort of example, I can only desire that someone inherit my wealth once I'm dead. Right? I can desire it antecedently, right? but the state of affairs that counts as fulfilling it is necessarily posthumous. But if it's correct to think that we form these desires in loving relationships to have our identities reflected in the other person's identities, in their understanding of us, then I think that if they fail to do that, then a desire of ours that pre-exists our death has gone unfulfilled. So if I could follow up with the religious um, point that Mark brought up, along with the desire fulfillment theory, imagine someone is a Jew or a Christian, and they think, and let's just assume it's true, that an individual upon his death goes to heaven, or will eventually end up in heaven. And let's think of heaven as a club med, but 10 times more fun and meaningful. And if you are upset that your spouse is having a wonderful life in club med, 10 times happier than she is now and 10 times more meaningful. And she got a, just got an early start in you. She's 50 years ahead of you, but still she's doing really well. We, I claim that we cannot make sense of the grief for two reasons. One, what is there to grieve? She's doing fantastic. And in fact, she's improved. She improved her well-being. You might miss her, but missing someone I think is different than grieving them. And number two, you might think this is a fairly selfish desire. If you say, look, I really would prefer that you be with me rather than this much better setting, that's a fairly selfish or destructive desire. Number three, if hell is available, which, the, which for example, the major lines of Catholicism and Protestantism believe, 
then it's even worse, right? Because then you're taking the risk that they might end up in hell instead of currently they're guaranteed a trip to heaven. So my question to you is, does your theory make r religious people grieving irrational? I, I want to claim that it does. I don't think it makes it irrational unless one thinks, right, that the relationship that the living bear to the deceased on this story is destroyed, right, by their death, right? So you might value very much, right, the relationship that you have with someone as during the mortal life that you share with that person and thereby grieve when they die because that relationship has been ruptured. Now, that I think is compatible with the thought, right, that I think you were articulating a moment ago, that if you in fact believe that they're in heaven and so forth, you might say, oh gosh, I shouldn't be grieving after all. They're in the most wondrous of worlds possible. If I follow their path, I'll someday be able to join them, right? I think you're right to note that there, this is to place grief in that case somewhat closer to missing a person, right? Sort of longing for, their, for the person, they're being absent. But it does seem to me like a rupture in the relationship right, of the sort that seems to me to be grievable. And I don't think it'd be irrational to grieve in that sense. They might have other good reasons not to, right, of the sort that you were suggesting a moment ago, that, you know, that this is only a temporary situation, right, if these theological narratives are correct. But I don't think it's thereby incoherent that they would grieve this loss, even if there's some greater gain to be found in the future. So much of it's incoherent, so much as the amount seems to be extraordinarily problematic, bordering on incoherent. Imagine an 80-year-old grieving the loss of, or a 90-year-old grieving the loss of his 90-year-old spouse, assuming that they're both going to go to heaven. Look, it's okay to miss the person, but that doesn't capture how grief occurs at funerals. At funerals, people scream, they collapse, they cry uncontrollably, and this continues often day in, day out. What I want to claim is when you look at grief in terms of the amount, we can the religious view of grief simply can't handle this sort of explanation because it's not enough to just say we're missing them when you're going to be reunited with them. And it might be the case that you say, look, I'm, I need to refigure my relation with them. Um, I'm, but refiguring a relationship with them it doesn't cause the screaming, the crying, the tearing out of hair, the collapsing mm -hmm. on the floor. So I'm worried about the amount of grief so much as that someone grieves the loss mm -hmm. of the, the, the decedent. Yeah, of course, details will vary from case to case, but I think it's possible that if a person sincerely espouses the belief system that you're describing and they believe that the deceased is enjoying heavenly bliss, that the amount of grief that they're undergoing does seem disproportionate. I think it's possible. But I take it that's part of what sometimes individuals in that community might try to do to try to assuage the screaming and so forth, right? Is to say, keep in mind that this is only a temporary absence, right? That if you were worried that they don't exist anymore, that's not actually true. They exist in this other realm. I take it that part of what people are trying to do is to provide some reassurance that is meant to, to soothe, right? Maybe these, this, these intense emotions. But, you know, I tend not to think that we're so in control of our emotional lives that we should be too hard on people who would be wailing and so forth under the conditions that you described. So there's a sense in which you could grieve because of the death of the relationship. In other words, that person ceases to exist, so the relationship ceases to exist. But it seems like you could also grieve because a bad thing has befallen that person. You might imagine grieving for a person who survives a car accident, all their bones are shattered and they've lost a lot of their limbs. And you could grieve for them because of what they've lost. Can you grieve for someone's death on the basis that they've been annihilated, that they cease to exist, even though they're not there for the annihilation? If you think that annihilation is bad, right, for someone, and you stand in the right kind of relationship to this person, I think that you could certainly, that a part of your grieving could be attributed to your belief that this person has suffered the bad of annihilation. I don't think that's going to be true in all cases of grief, since I think in some cases we're not maybe grieving losses that the other person has suffered primarily. But the thought that there is something bad about annihilation is an attractive but elusive notion. I think a lot of philosophers have been attracted to the thought that non-existence as such is somehow bad for us. I suppose the person who has been 
banging that drum most loudly in recent years has been David Benetton. But it's a difficult thesis to vindicate, I think. From one direction, you've got the Epicurean saying, how could it possibly be bad? It's not any state of you at all. I think there's a lot of really interesting work that's been produced by philosophers thinking about death and mortality that try to make sense of this. Kathy Barrett, I think, has written some very nice work appealing to the idea that there's something disorienting about the prospect of our non-existence that is responsible for our thinking that annihilation is bad. But even there, it's the same questions resurface. In what sense is it bad for you that you won't exist or don't exist, as opposed to just as being puzzling or confounding right? to contemplate that you don't or won't exist at some point. Mark, did you want to yeah. So I, I want to return to the notion that we have a moral reason to grieve. I, I just want to flat out deny this. So your argument is that you have a moral reason to create your practical psychology, or, or as you put it, have a normative interpretation. I'm lacking this intuition. So imagine you have an, a, mem a man who is a member of the Hasidic community in, in Brooklyn, New York, and he believes what his community believes. And he, he in sort of tough issues, he just follows what the rabbi says. And uh, we think, does he have a duty to take philosophy classes or to see a reformed rabbi or a conservative rabbi to get other positions, to debate it, to debate whether or not this is the correct way to live? I don't see it. I don't see, first of all, he doesn't have a duty. It's hard to see who's right he infringes. But leaving aside a duty, I, I just, I'm lacking the view that he has a reason to do so. Unless doing so is going to make his life go better. I doubt there's a reason there, but at least that would give us a prudential reason. Assuming his life, that exploring these issues is not going to make his life go better. I mean, he's not going to leave this community in any case. I don't, do not see it as a reason for the Hasidic man to revise or explore his moral and his metaphysical beliefs. And if that's true for him, then for a similar reason, I don't think that we have a duty to grieve. For the same reason, there's no reason, unless it's in your self-interest and even then I deny it, to reform your moral and metaphysical beliefs. So my claim is not that you have a duty to create a moral reason to grieve on the basis that you have a reason to reform your moral and metaphysical beliefs. But you said you have a duty, you have a moral reason to engage in normative interpretation with regard to your life, and that was analogous to creating your practical psychology. I take and your it, practical I identity. It yeah, but I don't think of these as I don't necessarily think of moral and metaphysical beliefs as elements of practical identity. Uh, okay, would the Hasidic man have a duty to go to psychotherapy rather than to go to to explore his moral and metaphysical beliefs as part of normative interpretation? I, I claim intuitively th th there's no moral reason to do so unless it's in his self interest, and I'm just going to stipulate that it's not in his self interest. I'll just say, look for some forthcoming work where I try to argue against that claim. I do think there is value in self-knowledge, right? I think that it, it's a way of relating to ourselves that allows us to stand in a relationship that is respectful of our own status as knowers and choosers. And someone who foregoes, right, forswears every opportunity for self-insight, self-understanding, self-knowledge, I think is doing themselves a disservice. This isn't to say that, that you should take up every opportunity for self-insight or self-knowledge either. It's something of an imperfect duty. I do think, and this is what I argue in chapter six of my book, is that uh, I think grief is special in the sense that it's this sort of massive data dump, right, of information about what you care about, what you value. So it's the occasion, right, for self-understanding and self-insight, or a special kind of occasion for self-understanding and self-insight that we don't often get, right, in the course of life. We would be foolish not to take this special sort of opportunity that grieving affords us. So it's certainly not the case that everyone has more reason to self-interrogate at every opportunity. But at the other hand, I think that a person is doing, them a, doing themselves a disservice if they don't interrogate the central conviction and, and goals and commitments of their lives, at least from time to time. Let's imagine you have a soldier in World War I who's surrounded by a band of brothers and one of them dies in battle and they take the opportunity to grieve and they learn an enormous amount about themselves and that relationship. And over time, more and more of these close friends die. Do we think that their ability for self-knowledge reduces with each subsequent death and each moment of grief, would there be some juncture where you shouldn't grieve or where you have reached maximal knowledge? Or is it the case that every relationship is unique and that there would always be some opportunity to learn more about yourself through that grieving process? That's a lovely, that's a lovely example to think about. 
So I think one of the things that fascinates me about grief, and please be mindful that what I'm about to say, I don't have a good explanation for. <laughs> I think it's one of the deep, mysterious features here that I think is just very hard to understand. Why can't we outrun it? And what I mean by that is why couldn't we be in a position where we acquire all of the self-insight, self-understanding that we could afford, that grief would afford us? Why can't we just get that all in advance, right? And thus sort of cancel or obviate whatever opportunity grief affords us for self-knowledge. And I, do, I don't know what to say about this other than that I think our psychologies are constructed such that we need, for lack of a better word, loss in some cases, in order to appreciate what it is that's significant to us in the world and what we want to retain that is significant in the world. In the example that you gave, I think it's very interesting to, to think about the ways in which other people are uh, on this sort of view that I'm supposing or asserting. Other people are a source of self-understanding for us. When I think about being the last member of the battalion or something like that, mm -hmm. right? I would think that the death of the penultimate member, yeah, is a kind of, there's a kind of poignancy to that, right? Because I'm trying, or I may be interested in trying to understand my wartime experience and how it shaped me, et cetera, et cetera. But I've lost one of my mirrors, right? I've lost one of my interlocutors. I've lost one of the people who might put me in a position to understand my own experience more richly and deeply and how it shaped me, et cetera, et cetera. I think one of the things that I sometimes need to remind people of or highlight for people is that in saying that grief is this special sort of opportunity for self-understanding or self-knowledge, I'm not saying that self-understanding or self-knowledge, we get it by going alone. It's not just locking ourselves in a room and reflecting on our lives or something like that. We get it in a lot of different ways. We get it, I think, in part through mourning, right? We get it by interacting with other grieving people who can remind us about facts about the deceased person's lives or facts about our relationship to the deceased person. So I, I think it's very important that despite the fact that the good I'm citing here is a self-regarding good, I don't want to depict the, the, if you will, the epistemology of grieving as being like solipsistic or something like that. So I'm curious, just to test the boundaries of grief, should God grieve the death of people um, because he's not going to gain any self-knowledge? For example, imagine that the, you have a lot of firstborn Egyptians that are killed in the Pharaoh's time. Should he grieve their deaths? Yeah, I guess my own feeling is that grief is the provenance of finite, interdependent social creatures like ourselves, right? Creatures who, in order to orient ourselves normatively and evaluatively in the world, we incorporate things outside of ourselves into our own self-conception, right? And I'm no theologian, but I wouldn't expect that would be something that most traditional pictures of God would say of God. He can lament their deaths, right? I think that's certainly coherent. Um, I think one of the challenges that we face in thinking about grief is we don't have a lot of words to describe the various kinds of emotions and so forth that people's deaths elicit in us. And sometimes we kind of default to grief, I think a little bit carelessly. But I think when I hear about people dying in the war in Ukraine, I'm not grieving them. I'm lamenting their deaths. It's sad that they've died under the circumstances that they did and probably had shorter and less satisfactory lives than they could have otherwise had. But I'm not grieving them, but I take it that God could be in a position to lament the deaths of mortals, but probably doesn't stand in a relation to them such that grief would be coherent. So I guess I want to then tie that into Mark's example. Imagine you're the last of the battalion and the second to last, a battalion member dies in combat. And you say, okay, I've missed the last interlocutor I have. I guess I'm tempted to say two things about that. One. It seems that you should lament the loss of a, a, of a locutor. You shouldn't grieve the loss, qua interlocutor. Um, and two, this seems to be a very selfish view of grief. If I'm going to grieve the loss of a band of brother in combat, it seems that it has to be other focused. Now, I might just not know why I'm grieving the individual, but to the extent that I know I'm grieving the individual because I've lost an interlocutor, and it seems that we're more appropriate to say you should lament the loss of the interlocutor, not that you should grieve the person. And two, this seems to be, this seems to make grief more selfish than it really should be seen as. Well, and I think it's one of the features of we human beings that our practical identities can be entangled with certain other peoples in such way that losses to them are losses to us. And I would say in the kind of example that Mark was articulating a few minutes ago, 
you can and probably should grieve if, in fact, your practical identity is entangled with the other soldier. But you can also lament their death for their sake. And you might be lamenting their death for their sake precisely because, right, they are part of your practical identity, your practical self-conception, right? When, you know, parents report that, you know, their child's disappointments register for them as their disappointments, right? That seems to be the, the uh, tell the tale as far as we can have relationships with others where their well-being and our well-being come to be married or interlaced in such a way, right, that losses to them are de facto losses to us. Just to make the point in a different sort of way, so let's suppose Mark is was in one of these battalions and I was in one of these battalions, but they're different. I don't think I have a reason to grieve the penultimate member of Mark's battalion, and he doesn't have a reason to grieve the penultimate member of my battalion, though we might have reasons to lament him. We might just say it's unfortunate that... You know, that the person died because we don't, I don't stand in the same identity constituting relationship to those members that he stands, he stood to them and vice versa.